The Third Angel's Message by A. T. Jones, eighteen ninety three. It was the summer of nineteen o eight. Ellen White was impressed to write the author of these studies, published in this volume. Along with her other counsel and instruction, she made this significant observation regarding these sermons, fifteen years old at the time. She said, I have been instructed to use those discourses of yours printed in the General Conference Bulletins of 1893. I was shown that many would be helped by these articles, these arguments, which were of the Holy Spirit's framing. This is letter 230, 1908, written in July 25. There has always been a need to repeat the messages that affirm the foundational truths of the Advent movement. In fact, the previous year, Ellen White had recognized and addressed this ever-present necessity. She said, I know from the light that God has given me that there should be a revival of the messages that have been given in the past. Close quote. Written in 1907, July 4. In the third of these sermons given at the 1893 General Conference, A.T. Jones was impressed to quote from a letter of Ellen White that had just been read three days earlier. In this letter, which Ellen White had written the previous month in Australia, she attempted to alert the church to the current crises. Jones reads, quote, Brethren and sisters, would that I might say something to awaken you to the importance of this time, the significance of the events that are now taking place. I point you to the aggressive movements now being made for the restriction of religious liberty. This was quoted in the General Conference Bulletin, January 28, 1893. It's also quoted in Six Testimonies, page 18, uh, paragraph 2. Now, what exactly was happening in 1893 that made the prophet say such things? And what were the arguments Jones used in these articles, which Ellen White referred to 15 years later? She explicitly identified two parties that would benefit at that later date by reading them. She said, I was shown that many would be helped by these articles, and especially those newly come to the faith who have not been made acquainted with our history as a people. It would be a blessing to you to read again these arguments, which were of the Holy Spirit's framing. Close quote. The first studies deal with a number of events, both political and religious, which were taking place in the time leading up to 1893. The listener may be tempted to skip these, not understanding their context or significance for our day. We must remember that history will repeat itself. Let us review briefly the history of that time so the arguments given regarding religious liberty will have context and we can begin to see their application to our day. Now, 1893 was a very interesting year. A phenomenal project was in the works, the World's Columbian Exposition. The magnitude of this event must be understood and we must see its connection with a groundswell of desire to affirm the United States as a Christian nation. In fact, the previous year, one of the Supreme Court justices, in his remarks, had declared the United States to be a Christian nation. In order to build this background and connection to religious liberty, let us note the book Sunday's Coming, written by G. Edward Reed, the chapter entitled, World's Columbian Exposition of 1893. Quote, The second half of the 19th century was an age of fairs and expositions held in London, Paris, and other great cities throughout the world. The World's Columbian Exposition, held in Chicago in 1893, was the first critically and economically successful World's Fair in the United States. 
conceived as a celebration of the 400th anniversary of Columbus's landing in the New World, the exposition held a near mythological appeal at the time. The exposition showcased a cityscape just 60 years old, magnificently reborn just 22 years after the Great Chicago Fire. The exposition was officially dedicated on October 21, 1892, to coincide with the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage to the Americas, but it did not open for business until May 1, 1893, because of delays in getting everything ready. By the time it closed, six months later, on October 30, 1893, more than 27 million visitors had paid the 50-cent admission price to see the great site. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there were 62 million people in the United States at that time, which means almost half of them saw the fair. This number is even more significant when we recognize that all came either by horse and buggy or train. At the time, the fair was considered the greatest event of its kind in history. So, what does all of this have to do with Sunday? Surprisingly, a lot. Apparently, because of the delay in construction, workers preparing for the fair were encouraged to work seven days a week. And those countries and companies and churches wishing to have an exposition in the fair were also encouraged to set up on Sunday. The Presbyterians refused to unpack their boxes or utilize the space given them on Sunday and declined all contact with the, quote, sacrilegious and Sabbath-breaking exposition, close quote. The Presbyterians and other church groups took their case to Congress by circulating thousands of petitions to churches across the country. These petitions were signed by millions of people expressing opposition to the fair being opened on Sunday. Though many people opposed the idea of the government getting involved in this religious matter, Congress capitulated to the demands of the religious groups and passed an act under which the appropriation of funds to support the fair was contingent on the Great Exposition being closed to the public on Sundays. The resulting law, which I found in the law library at the Library of Congress, reads as follows, quote, Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled. Section 4. That it is hereby declared that all appropriations herein made for or pertaining to the world's Columbian exposition are made upon the condition that the said exposition shall not be open to the public on the first day of the week, commonly called Sunday, And if the said appropriations be accepted by the Corporation of the State of Illinois, known as the World's Columbian Exposition, upon this condition, it shall be, and it is hereby, made the duty of the World's Columbian Commission, created by the Act of Congress of April 25th, 1890 to make such rules or modifications of the rules of said corporation and shall require the closing of the exposition on the said first day of the week, commonly called Sunday. Approved August 5, 1892. This law, recognized by many to be unconstitutional on its face, was passed anyway because the majority of those contacting Congress demanded it. The reason I have used this chapter to highlight this unusual circumstance is that we know that the big end-time Sunday law will come about the exact same way. It will be urged by religious leaders, demanded by the people, and yielded to by Congress. This is found in Sunday's Coming, 2nd edition, 
pages 66 and 67. You will see in these first sermons how A.T. Jones went to Congress and skillfully presented arguments against the Sunday Law. The Lord was using Brother Jones to battle for religious liberty, the most profound freedom there is, the freedom that is at the very heart of the gospel itself. Jones will reveal the connection this freedom has to the righteousness of Christ and the third angel's message. There were other interesting historical developments taking place in this era. Thirty years before, in 1863, the very year the Seventh-day Adventist Church organized, the National Reform Association, the NRA, had its beginnings. Within its first year, it was at work on its main agenda, which was to amend the Constitution of the United States and to enforce Sunday sacredness through legislation. After failing for several years to accomplish their desire at the national level, the NRA turned to the individual states with much greater success. As a result of the NRA and several other organizations that joined the cause, between 1878 and 1900, approximately 250 Seventh-day Adventists were arrested for violating new Sunday laws in the states of Alabama, Arkansas, California, Georgia, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, Missouri, North Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Washington. The church membership in 1890 was approximately 30,000 people. With today's membership, this would represent over 100,000 Seventh-day Adventists arrested for Sunday law violations during a 20-year period. What is not often realized is the extent of agitation for the Sunday laws. Between 1888 and 1900, there were over 28 attempts for a national Sunday law, over two per year on the average. During this same time, there were Adventists arrested and or Sunday agitation several other countries, including Australia, Canada, China, Great Britain, Germany, France, Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Scotland, Greece, Russia, Singapore, and South Africa. What other movements at this time were promoting union of church and state? You may be surprised. This time frame was considered to be the golden age of spiritualism. By 1864, spiritualists claimed to number 7 million in the United States. They organized as a secret society under the name Order of Eternal Progress. In their publication, The Banner of Light, on May 7, 1864, they said, quote, A system will be unfolded sooner or later that will embrace in its fold church and state, for the object of the two should be one and the same, close quote. Now, we were warned in 1884, quote, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. This is quoted from 4SP 405, the first paragraph. During this time, another historical development of prophetic significance was taking place. The papacy had received a deadly wound in 1798, and it was rapidly recovering during the 1800s. It was during this time that the papacy adopted as official dogmas the doctrine of infallibility and the Immaculate Conception, as well as the Adoration of Mary. 
These events were the background for the 1888-1893 era and for the messages that Brother Jones gave at the 1893 General Conference in Battle Creek, Michigan. He not only looked at what the politics were of the day, but he brought in the message of the righteousness of Christ as our only hope to meet these crises. That righteousness, though Jones preached it about a hundred years ago, is just as fresh and alive for us today. We need this counsel as much as the members of the congregation which heard the original sermons did. Revelation 7 indicates that the winds are being held back until God's people are sealed. The sealing has been delayed. In 1896, over three years after these studies by A.T. Jones, Ellen White stated this, quote, By exciting that opposition, that's to the message at Minneapolis, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency which might have been theirs in carrying the truths to the world as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted and by the action of our own brethren, has been in a great degree kept away from the world. Close quote. One Selected Messages, page 234, uh, paragraph 6. Had the message been given in its fullness and accomplished its purpose, Jesus would have already come. The year after these studies were given, Ellen White wrote the following to her son and daughter-in-law, Edson and Emma. Quote, If those who claim to have a living experience in the things of God had done their appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our world with power and great glory. This was written November 14, 1894. Four years later, at a similar statement was made, quote, Had the purpose of God been carried out by his people in giving the message of mercy to the world, Christ would have come to the earth, and the saints, ere this, would have received their welcome in the city of God. This was written in 1898. So here we are today with these messages full of practical instructions in righteousness. We are reminded of what Ellen Wright wrote about the message and the messengers two years after these studies. She said, quote, The Lord, in his great mercy, sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands, that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Never was there a time when the Lord would manifest his great grace unto his chosen ones more fully than in these last days when his law is made void. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Close quote. Testimonies, page 91, paragraph 2. It is the publisher's prayer that through these studies, your heart may thrill 
as you look at a review of the history in 1893, and as you listen to the arguments being made for a Sunday law, and as you observe how God raised up a man like A.T. Jones to debate against these laws, and then learn, as the sermons are given, lesson after lesson, that at the very heart of the matter is the righteousness of Christ. May you sense the value and the preciousness of these powerful messages. May you embrace them as they present for our consideration our only ark of safety, the righteousness of Christ. For soon we are told that a crisis is going to burst upon this world. It is quoted in five testimonies, page 711, quote, A great crisis awaits the people of God. A crisis awaits the world. The most momentous struggle of all ages is just before us. Events which for more than 40 years we have upon the authority of the prophetic word declared to be impending are now taking place before our eyes. Already the question of an amendment to the Constitution, restricting liberty of conscience has been urged upon the legislators of the nation. The question of enforcing Sunday observance has become one of national interest and importance. We well know what the result of this movement will be. But are we ready for the issue? Have we faithfully discharged the duty which God has committed to us of giving the people warning of the danger before them? Close quote. In closing, dear listener, consider another statement from the messenger of the Lord in the Review and Herald, May 21st, 1895. Quote, the reason why the children of Israel forsook Jehovah was that the generation rose up that had not been instructed concerning the great deliverance from Egypt by the hand of Jesus Christ. Their fathers had not rehearsed to them the history of the divine guardianship that had been over the children of Israel through all their travels in the wilderness. Close quote. Our history has been preserved for us from 1893, 1888, and in 1844. These dates all held events of momentous significance in the history of Adventism. We as a people need to know who we are and the mission that God has given to us. And the only way we can do this is to review our own history, which contains the messages that God has given to us as a people. As we do this, The prediction made two years before A.D. Jones gave these sermons, which he also fulfilled in part, will come to pass. Quote, One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. Close quote. Review and Herald, December 23rd, 1890. This is what these sermons are about. May your heart be blessed as you prayerfully Consider them is our heartfelt desire.